Um, because after all, data only serves as well if it's doing a job of making all of our lives easier. And I think sometimes we forget that. So I'm actually going to talk about some really quite diverse things than you've heard this evening. Um, largely based on a project uh, that we did and have been doing since Brexit. And I'm afraid I am going to talk about Brexit a little bit because it has great relevance to this particular subject. So if I said to you the word, oh, I don't know, let's hang on a second, make sure this clicker works. That's, that, that's going well, huh? Uh, 2016, how do we feel about 2016? <laughs> Miserable, terrible, shit. Um, yes, absolutely. In fact, if you type 2016 into Google, you will return such results as, is 2016 the worst year ever? Uh, is 2016 a bad year? And one real optimist in the middle of all of this, is 2016 going to be a white Christmas? Um, you always have a snowflake in the middle of everything, I think it is fair to say. Now, what is absolutely apparent about 2016 was the thing that surprised us most was apparently not the seemingly endless deaths of famous people. Um, it was, in fact, the unfathomable decision-making process of our fellow man. So this is the thing that seems to perturb us most of all about 2016. From the EU referendum... <laughs> from Donald Trump being elected as 45th President of the United States, from Mountain Dew, who almost had a product called Hitler Did Nothing Wrong, to a boat in the South Pacific Ocean, which was almost called Boaty McBoatface, and perhaps most worryingly of all, there is in fact a whale now swimming around called Mr. Splashy Pants. Yes, I can think we can all agree that in 2016, uh, we all got seriously hacked off with one thing, and that is this, the people. Now, 2016 was a challenging year. It was the year that people behaved unpredictably. It was the year that we all felt, whatever our camp, that people behaved unreasonably. And that is exactly what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. I'm gonna to talk to you about how perhaps we can focus a little bit more on the human in all of this and understand how data can really help us to make some useful stuff. And what I think 2016 is symptomatic of most of all is our unwillingness to understand human behaviour. So we live in a paradoxical time. We live in this absolutely weird world where we are at once self-obsessed and yet also utterly repulsed by other people. And we can see symptoms of our self-obsession everywhere we look. Now, probably almost everyone in here has watched a TED talk, I imagine. In fact, in 2012, TED became the most popular online lecture series, and by 2012 had racked up viewing figures of somewhere around a billion views uh, in 2012 alone. Really staggeringly high figures. Do you want to know the most popular subject? Psychology. Data suggests that psychology is the thing that fascinates us most. If you look at the New York Times bestseller list, you'll see confirmation of this idea. So from things like hillbilly energy to homo juice and sapiens. Anyone reading sapiens here? Show of hands. Yeah, it's radically popular. I think the one defining thing that we can see from all of this is that we are absolutely obsessed with our own human condition. And the funny thing about this is that marketing has not escaped this strange trap. Now, I work in research, so of course I'm going to stand up here and support the research industry, aren't I? Wrong, I'm afraid. Um, the MRS, which is the Market Research Society, projected an annual sales turnover in 2014 of the total UK research industry of £4 billion. That is a lot of money, I think we can all agree. I own a research agency and I do not make anywhere near that amount of money in a year, but I would like some of it. So thus far, you can imagine that the one thing that we believe we all have in great abundance is tremendous self-awareness. But I'm afraid that despite the fact that we're spending £4 billion a year on research and all of that data that comes through, we are also getting it more wrong than ever. So if we consider just behind us uh, a few examples of the wonderful world of marketing and advertising, uh, my favourite is coming up in a second, which you'll see. Oh, oh yeah, Brad Pitt. Anyone remember the um, Brad Pitt? Perfume ad, it was a wonderful thing. 
Um, we are getting this stuff more wrong than ever, despite the fact that we have more data at our disposal than ever before. So on the eve of the US presidential elections, uh, national polls suggested that Hillary Clinton had a percentage point lead of around 4% over Donald Trump, which some statistical models translated into a probability of her winning of somewhere between 77 and 99%. So most people predicted, right up until the election, that Hillary Clinton was almost guaranteed to win. And whilst of course she won the popular vote, ultimately she lost. And so the point of that data is also lost because they got it totally wrong. Now we didn't escape that strange trap in the UK either, because on the eve of the EU referendum last year, everyone remember how they were feeling on that evening? <laughs> Wonderful, I'm sure we were all feeling really confident, weren't we, in London? And we were feeling confident because we had all of this data at our disposal, which strongly suggested that whilst it would be a much closer race than we had hoped for, ultimately there would be a victory for Remain. And actually, as Professor John Curtis um, absolutely said, in May, people were saying Remain were making progress, they weren't, there were just more phone polls, which were, you've guessed it, wrong. So despite the fact that we're getting more data, there's no sense that any of this data is perhaps even any more reliable than it's ever been. In fact, it's leading us to some quite wrong conclusions about how people are going to behave. In fact, I think despite the fact that researchers are earning £4 billion a year, they could not summarise the EU referendum any better than this one lady who I spoke to who said this. Do you mind turning the volume up, Elizabeth? One second. One second. Great, let's have a go. Can I say, it was a bit of a, well, the bug of the cells up really, didn't they, to be honest, you know, it's uh, typical politics. They buggered themselves up. That was, I think we can all agree, a beautiful encapsulation that research was really never able to get to, and that one lady absolutely was. And this isn't just politics. In fact, the Advertising Standards Authority in 2012 projected that, in fact, of all marketing done every single year, 89% is not remembered. So 89% of the time, we may as well not have bothered. And for those of us that work in marketing, which I imagine is lots of us in this room today, that I think we can all agree is a depressing statistic and an indictment on all of this data really being used quite ineffectually. So I believe that this is a little bit like our relationship with meat at this point. We all kind of like meat, don't we? We don't really like the gory bits, which I think is a little bit like our relationship with human behaviour. We kind of like it, but only once the messy stuff is taken care of, perhaps once it's dressed as a kind of glossy reality TV show or projected glamorously live from the TED stage. And unless it is in those forms, we're not that interested. Data in its own right does not tell us about how people behave or why they behave. And I think it's interesting that it probably is indicative of our shock every single time we hear people talking in this kind of guise. I voted to leave, but to be honest, I didn't feel I knew enough about it. Anyone else feel really horrified the day after the EU referendum? Start feeling really bad about people we knew that voted differently from us? And that was a common experience last year. It was a common experience in the media as well, because people said stuff like, stupid English people to blame for Brexit, says Alan Cumming. That was not an isolated incident. I think we can probably all agree that in the media, lots of people were blamed for this kind of stuff. But I think we fundamentally got this wrong. I think we got this absolutely wrong last year, because fundamentally, if we listen to people like George Bernard Shaw, who said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world, the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. And perhaps he made some sense. Perhaps, instead of behaving unreasonably, perhaps people are reasonably unreasonable. There are two profoundly challenging problems in the world today that I'm going to mention briefly that I think are absolutely pertinent to this idea of what we do with all of this information. And the first one is that there is too much stuff to buy. Profoundly too much stuff. Our economic wealth as a society has been built on the back of creating demand. Capitalism demands endless growth. Do you know what it produces? Any guesses? No guesses? Um, you won't have guessed this because what capitalism produces is Christmas-scented toilet roll. 
In 2016, in Tesco, you could buy Christmas scented toilet roll. We bought some for our staff because we're nice employers. Um, they loved it. I'm not sure how useful it was in the grand scheme of things. The other thing that capitalism produces is jam, and lots and lots and lots of it. In fact, again, if you walked into a Tesco's right now, you would be able to purchase at least 104 different varieties of jam. I think we can all agree that that's quite a lot. In fact, if you averaged one jar of jam every single week, it would take you two years before you got to the end of the fixture and had to repeat yourself. That's an awful lot of stuff. What's really clear from science is just having more stuff in the world doesn't mean that anyone buys more of it. A really famous report from 1995 mocked up two fixtures, one with 24 jam jars and one with six. And whilst it's true that twice the number of people visited the 24 jam jars, the number of people that bought something was just 3%, whereas the number of people who bought something from the six jam jar fixtures was 30%. More stuff does not mean that people buy more things. Now, interestingly, Netflix was obviously uh, mentioned earlier, which I'm guessing pretty much everyone here has. What interests me about Netflix is, of course, how brilliant they are and how brilliant they are at designing their user experience based on their data. What also interests me about Netflix is how much time we spend searching for something. Quite a lot of time, isn't it? 115 hours a year, actually. And if we mine our data really carefully, we can translate that into five days of our year that we spend just searching. Just searching, not watching, just searching. Um, think of what stuff you could do in five days in a year. Quite a lot of stuff, really. Um, I think that's horrifying. I think that is too much stuff. The second problem is technology. Now, we're all here talking about technology, and of course, uh, digital technology is being predominantly a feature of that. Um, what I think is true is that we are absolutely living in an age where technology has become all-consuming. We live in a world where the worst thing that can happen to you in a day is not leaving your keys at home, but your phone. That is the crazy world that we live in. Um, it's crazy and it's really shocking. The average Briton checks their smartphone at least 221 times a day. In fact, there's an app that can allow you to uh, sense how many times you even just touch your phone, and it's around somewhere like a thousand times a day. So that tells us how much of a security blanket our phones have become. We spend on average in Britain eight hours and 41 minutes a day on all of our screens, which again is a big figure, right? It's big, particularly when you uh, imagine that that is in fact more time than the average person spends sleeping on all of our screen devices. And the net result of that is it makes us feel anxious. It makes us feel deeply anxious. In fact, I wanna do a bit of an experiment on you now. So what you'll notice on your seats are some eye masks. So if I can ask you to just pop one on. Okay, what I want to do is just get you for a moment. Not to fall asleep, but just to listen. Yeah, pop your eye mask on, great. Excellent. If you don't have an eye mask, just shut your eyes. If you haven't got the time to look, you probably would just pass it, it will just look the same. It's confusing actually. I think it's a bit confusing. There's so many, isn't there? I suppose if you first come in, you should get a Off now. How did you feel? Disturbed. Disturbed. A little bit anxious. Is that again? In a marketplace. In a marketplace. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know if you've ever sat on a bus. Um, probably have, you live in London. Um, if you've sat on a bus and heard any of those bleeps or those kind of ringtones or noises, and then you've looked around and you've just seen everyone just immediately start patting themselves down. Um, it makes us all feel pretty tense because it preys on our humanity. We heard earlier about cave paintings, but absolutely from an anthropological point of view, mobile technology, the data they understand from us, uh, means that they prey on our humanity. They prey on that really deep-seated need for us to look out for things on the peripheries of our vision and also things that are 
appear in our um, kind of aural universe, and it's a survival mechanism. We cannot not listen to this stuff. So next time you try and not look at your phone, know that you're working against your own humanity there, so give yourself a break. Um, mobile technology absolutely preys on that stuff. Now, in the context of the fact that you all feel a, bit, a little bit tense listening to approximately 10 seconds of mobile devices going off, also know that you receive 5,000 messages a day from marketing businesses. And that's probably quite a conservative estimate. 5,000 messages every single day is an awful lot of stuff for all of us to endure, I would suggest. So the next time that you're wondering why a marketing message hasn't cut through or your really brilliant product message or user experience isn't working, it's probably because we're all watching pictures of cats on the internet, I'm afraid. It's just how we are. We're human beings. Now, who here has heard the phrase, content is king? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I've heard this phrase lots and lots. I'll tell you who hasn't heard this phrase. Uh, people haven't heard this phrase. What they've heard is too much stuff, too little time, and too little thought as to the purpose of the content that they're hearing. So content might be king for us, but it's not actually king for anyone else in the world in the context of all of these things that are going on around us. In fact, I would suggest that we are living in an arms race, an unwinnable war producing the most enormous amount of horseshit you have ever seen. And I think probably absolutely the best person who can sum this up is Oracle of the Future Charlie Brooker uh, when he says... TV advertising used to work like this. You sat on your sofa while creators were paid to throw a bucket of shit in your face. Today you're expected to sit in the bucket, fill it with your own shit and tip it all over your head while filming yourself with your mobile. Then you upload the video to the creatives. You do the work, they still get paid. So there's really one common theme of all of this presentation, which is someone somewhere is making a lot of money out of all that data that they're getting from you, and we're kind of all suffering as a result. And I think the really big problem of all of this data and all this content is it disguises a much, much bigger problem, and that is the one that is really going to kill your brand, or your politics, or your newspaper, and that is this, and that is usefulness. Now, if you go to conferences, if you go to talks at things like uh, General Assembly, um, you're going to hear loads of stuff about people like Amazon and Uber and Deliveroo, and you might even start to hear things about Donald Trump and how successful his campaign was. And what people typically talk about is how whizzy the technology is and how salient the operations are and how contentious the messaging is and how they're disrupting the field around them. And I would suggest that that is absolutely bollocks. They are not disrupting anything. They could not be behaving in a more conservative way if they tried because they are making products that work, they make life easier, they're straightforward, they require a few choices, and they solve problems. In fact, they don't just solve any problems, they solve your problem. Like this, you can't get an appointment at your GP. That bus is pretty effective. That is the definition of a brand. These guys are not disrupting anything. They're not disrupting the rules of communication, they are applying the rules of communication. The definition of a brand is to be useful. Now, I'm just going to conclude on a few thoughts here. Whilst we're all worrying about content and lots and lots of data, the thing that is really going to kill your brand or your campaign is that someone else out there understands that they're going to produce something that people actually want to use. Amazon did a great job. Uber did a great job of that. Just made stuff easier. They made things that you really wanted to use. And if you think about that in terms of the implications for marketing, I think it's really, really clear. We have to produce better stuff that people actually want to use that understands the humanity of all of our situation. Because if you don't, people will public punish you. And they say stuff like this. David Cameron, when he agreed to this, was banking on a vote winner for the last election, which was true, but he was disrespectful and arrogant because he thought he would walk the referendum. I'm a Tory, but I'm glad the useless, weak-kneed tosser is out. He has no reality with ordinary people. Let's make GB great again. And regardless of whether you agree with John from Hull, what is absolutely true is that he feels ignored. He feels overwhelmed and that people are talking at him and that they don't understand him as a person. And in a world of too much stuff, is it really that unreasonable that people simply want products that work and that are useful? Thank you very much.